better economic outcomes than the one of the United States that is just Wild West capitalism. Nouriel, does that mean that MMT will be here? And again, what does that mean for, you know, for assets? Well, we are already effectively in MMT or helicopter drop of money because we have massive budget deficits of the order of 10% in Europe. In the US, is going to be closer to 20%. And we have central banks that are effectively doing unlimited QE. Formally, in the case of the US or Japan, informally, even in the Eurozone and other parts of Europe. So what's the difference between MMT and large monetized budget deficits? Uh, only two fig leaves. Uh, in one case, you buy the bonds uh, in the primary markets if you do MMT. In the other case, if you do well, QE, you buy it in the secondary a week later. Two, MMT is supposed to be permanent, while QE is supposed to be temporary. But uh, this temporary QE is becoming uh, permanent. Nora, so effectively, we are in that world of MMT. We are out of time. Nora Robini, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again, particularly in London. Stay with us. John Golub on the markets. This is Bloomberg. It's such an interesting new world. The world is changing. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. While everyone is zigging, we're zagging. We feel like we can maybe help people out more. We have an enormous number of big ideas. I do double down on helping other black founders, whether it's fundraising, hiring, growth, product, whatever it is that they need. sense of the real-time action, the 10-year yield tumbling now 11 basis points, so continuing in this knee-jerk risk-off field. The current president has cloaked American darkness for much too long. Too much anger, too much fear, too much division. Here and now, I give you my word. If you entrust me with the presidency, I will draw on the best of us, not the worst. I'll be an ally of the light, not the darkness. It's time for us, for we the people, to come together. 
And make no mistake, United, we can and will overcome this season of darkness in America. The vice president last night, an extraordinary 2020 of politics. It is a different convention for the Democrats, no doubt a different convention for the Republicans. Bloomberg contributor from Iona College with some wonderful books on, including the new one, Broken. Uh, Jeannie Zaino joins us right now. Jeannie, I want to spin forward. What did the Republicans, what did President Trump's team learn from this Democratic convention experiment? You know, I think one thing that the president has already been vocal about that he learned is that this is much better done live than it is pre-taped. We saw some of the sort of pre-taped blunders that sort of fell flat. And I think the president is masterful at getting a viral moment and getting, you know, sort of producing television as we've seen over and over. So I think that he really does want to make as much as possible of this live and get the surprises like the Democrats got last night with the fireworks. I think they mm -hmm. want to get some sort of surprises like that weaved in throughout the right. four nights. Does he stay on script? Does President Trump stay on the script of the last number of months, as our Kevin Cirilli says on Law and Order, et cetera, or does he go against what the vice president said, and does the president take from Reagan a morning in America? You know, it, it's so fascinating. This is what I'm so curious about. We saw Joe Biden last night really right on script, tight shot, you know, n nobody interrupting him, booing, cheering, nothing. This was a scripted moment, even though it was a live speech. And the president, that is not his strong suit. He likes to play to a crowd. He likes to go off script. He likes to sort of do sort of ad hoc moments and, you know, impromptu things. So I think we're going to see a little bit of both from the president. But we do know the theme is this honoring the great American story. That's what they would like to do is talk about they, they have these nights of land of promise, opportunity, heroes, greatness, and they would like to end with that sort of land of greatness theme and the president himself getting renominated. From where you sit right now, and certainly these are early days moving to the first Tuesday of November, which of these teams can get out the vote best? You know, they, it's so fascinating. I think the Democrats were like a laser beam focused on getting the vote out and obviously saying that Donald Trump should not be elected. I, I am amazed by, you know, that, that sort of Brady Bunch moment when all of his former competitors were out there last night talking about and supporting Joe Biden. I've never seen the Democratic Party so mm. unified as they are unified to get out the vote and, and against Donald Trump. So I think they have done what they wanted to do in that regard. But this is a battle of getting out the vote in, you know, the battleground states, essentially, those six to eight states that will decide this election. And President Trump proved, the Republicans proved in 2016, that they can do that in places like Michigan and Wisconsin. So as bad as things are numbers-wise for the campaign on the Republican side, they are very good at that. And, and we saw the Democrats last night try to hit them where they do need to hit them, and that is on the economy, because Trump still wins when it comes to who's better mm -hmm. at shepherding the economy, even through the pandemic. Does President Trump want a stimulus bill? Is he advantaged by an agreement with Speaker Pelosi and Senator Schumer, or does he just really want this to struggle and go away? I think he wants a bill, and I think that, that it makes sense. I think the Democrats don't have much of an incentive politically, obviously, uh, to, to get that done, because we've seen the president come out hours after that August 7th um, meeting where he said that I will do what I can unilaterally because this is not going anywhere. I do think he wants a bill. I don't know if they're going to get there because, of course, you've got to combat with the, the Democrats in the House, and so far— you know, they have not, we have not seen a willingness on two sides to come together. Jeannie, thank you so much. Jeannie Zeno with some sharp coverage here. I really can't say enough about our effort in books and in writing at Iona College. A new book coming out, Broken, widely anticipated. Not right now on a Friday, we widely anticipate our first word news. Here's Ritika Gupta. Thanks, Tom. Joe Biden accused President Trump of failing in his most basic duty to protect Americans. Last night, Biden accepted the Democratic nomination for president, and he made it clear what a Biden administration would tackle first. As president, the first step I will take will be to get control of the virus that has ruined so many lives. Because I understand something this president hasn't from the beginning. We will never get our economy back on track. We will never get our kids safely back in schools. 
We'll never have our lives back until we deal with this virus. Biden also said the U.S. doesn't need a tax code that rewards wealth more than it rewards work. He says it's time for the biggest corporations to pay their fair share. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has formally demanded that the United Nations reinstate global sanctions against Iran. Pompeo also slammed European allies who oppose the move. He accused them of a failure to lead and of appeasing the Iranian regime. President Trump says this will be the most fraudulent election in history. The president told Fox News, quote, they're trying to steal the election. He said that mail-in voting will lead to widespread cheating, even though there's been no evidence of that in previous elections. Former Trump campaign guru Steve Bannon is free on a $5 million bond. Bannon has pleaded not guilty to charges he conspired to commit fraud and launder money whilst raising funds for a border wall. Prosecutors say the former White House chief strategist defrauded hundreds of thousands of donors. Global News 24 hours a day on air and Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I'm seeing Tom. I read a lots on economics, lots on politics today. What about the markets? This is the absolute must listen interview of the day. Coming up, Chris Crisanti on what you need to do this weekend to think about your portfolio, to structure your portfolio, and to make the drama changes into September that are needed. Futures negative three. Christopher Crisanti, you need to buy more Apple and more Amazon. I'm kidding. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Surveillance is surveillance time. Francine Lacroix and Tom Keene through much of this Friday morning. John Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz off. I'll be on radio with Paul Sweeney uh, later. But an interesting Friday, not a boring Friday on Wall Street. Right now, we need to regroup. We do that with MAI Capital Chief Equity Strategist Chris Crisanti, who has been absolutely stunning at finding growthy value. I say that very carefully. That's Graham Dowd and Cottle, 1948, I think it was. Chris Crisanti, how do you define growthy value right now? Um, what we're looking for right now are what we call margin protectors. These are stocks that you may have to pay up for a little bit, but, but they're part of what we call value in a transformed economy. They're asset light, 
And most importantly right now, their margins aren't terribly impacted by COVID. So you've got your classic FANG stock that everybody knows about, but you also have stocks like Domino's Pizza or even Lockheed Martin, which is building the F-35. Interesting. And these are companies that are making it through to the other end. But I have to tell you, I think their run is coming not to an end, but I think there's even better places to be right now as COVID starts peaking out in the United States. Where are those better places? I mean, the, you know, the, what we get is small cap international and that, but get more specific, Chris Cassenti. Sure, Tom. So now we've ridden these margin protectors and they've way outperformed the general market. So instead, let's look at terrific companies that are affected by COVID. The classic example would be Disney. So Disney, of course, is a terrific company, great moats, great content, except, of course, that half of their revenue comes from theme parks and cruise ships. So if you see, as we do, a two or three years down the road, a world that is much more normal, or at least the way it used to be, you think that Disney is really going to capitalize on that. So we're trying to go to where the puck is going to be. And if we're uh, talking about Disney, we're talking about the medical companies that rely on elective surgeries. We're talking even on real estate-related uh, companies like Otis Elevator. So we think that's kind of the next leg yeah. of the market here. See, Francine, that's the Gretzky School of Investment, that from Chris Grisanti there. <laughs> right. Francine? <laughs> but Chris, is, is that on the assumption that we get a vaccine? When do we get back to, to something that looks more like our old lives? You know, is it two or three years? Right. Or will we have permanent changes to the way we live? Well, I, I think the answer is yes to both of those questions. I think uh, we, we're a little more pessimistic on the vaccine than, than the market consensus. It's tough to do a vaccine. And the second step, which nobody really talks about, it's tough to produce you know, in the United States, then 350 million batches of it. For example, the leading vaccine has to be kept at negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit right now from when it comes out of the lab to when it's injected in your arm. It's a huge logistical nightmare for so many things. So we think we're talking two or three years before we get back to quote unquote normal, but we also think the world is permanently changed, not necessarily in bad ways, but in ways that favor these margin protectors, the, the, the the online delivery folks, the digital payment folks. So we've just greatly accelerated the change to the new place we were heading towards in the first place. Okay, but by what, by two, three years? And what do you do with the big tech companies? So does an Amazon become so big that at some point, it, you know, they want to break it up? Yes, of course, that's the, the real risk. Now, now, I'm old enough to remember and having owned Microsoft in the 90s when the government did file the antitrust case there. That, uh, that caused some headline hiccups, but at the end of the day, they kept on powering through. And the real reason was if you do break up these things, there's value in the park. So at the end of the day, what are you going to do? Are you going to sell an Amazon on the threat of a breakup and buy something that, that isn't <clears throat> performing nearly as well? So, so I think it's yeah. clearly a risk. But I don't think you, you get off the train. Chris, you've been brilliant on Apple. We celebrate a $2 trillion company. What's the path look like to $3 trillion? Well, Tom, the, the path is more of, of the, you know, to draw the ruler out. It, uh, and it's, it's doing just what it has done before, which is emphasize service, which is obviously hugely high margin. Uh, you know, the, Apple is at the end of the day, though, still a company that relies on hardware. The iPhones obviously produce much more than half the revenue and profits for the company. So I would say love Apple, terrific company, great management. Um, but at the end of the day, still, it's a hardware company. So be a little careful vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis some more asset light places like a, a Facebook or a Google, which have... Um, yeah, a, a much more higher margin business model. The question I always uh, ask you, use of cash, I mean, I guess buybacks are going to come and such. Do you factor in dividend growth as sustaining this and, frankly, helping Jerome Powell with stability? Yeah, I, I do, Tom. I think you're going to start to see cash flows improve. Uh, boy, they really took a hit. And, and I think the next six months are critical. So the euphoria of the stimulus will start to fade. We can't do another four or five trillion dollars over the next six months. So again, we're slightly more pessimistic than the consensus. We think there are going to be choppy waters. If I was Joe Biden, he may just repeat what happened to Barack Obama, who took off at six weeks before the market bottomed in, in the financial crisis and rode a market up for a bunch of years. So, you know, timing is everything, and, and we're keeping an eye on the next six months. 
What is the one thing, um, Chris, that you want to know for the next six months? Is it, you know, volatility in markets? Is it where this extra stimulus actually goes to? Or is it just who wins the U.S. election? Because no, that changes, I, you know, portfolio management. Sure. I, I think all of us in the mediatocracy get, get uh, every four years, get real wound up about who's going to win. And at the end of the day, there are other things that are going to move this market more for the long term. Uh, Right now, there, there's no doubt in my mind that COVID news will move the market over the next six months, even more than the election. So if you get a fantastic vaccine that clears the hurdles, that's going to be great news no matter who wins. Uh, conversely, as we probably more expect, if you get some setbacks in that area, or if unemployment remains stubbornly high, which I think will start to happen, I think that will move the market more than the election, too. But how quickly can we get a vaccine, Chris? Even if we have the formula, then you need to distribute right. it. Right, so right. Is, and is there anything that the time, I mean, gets ahead of itself? Right? Absolutely. No, no, we, we think there's optimism that's, that's a little unfounded, especially with the market up so high. That tends to breed even more optimism. But uh, if the vaccine was discovered tomorrow, would we all line up to get the shots? I don't think so. I think we'd wait to see how it's received, how the efficacy and, of course, the safety works. Um, so, I, you know, this is going to be an evolution, not a revolution to a new place. So, you know, we're really keeping our eye on okay, Chris. A, a trend that takes a while. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Chris Grazanti there, MAI Capital Chief Equity Strategist and Senior Portfolio Manager. Now, coming up, we're just talking uh, with Chris about vaccines. Dr. Andrew Pekosh, Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health Professor and Virologist. We continue to track COVID-19. This is Bloomberg. forecast 1 million 800,000 jobs is the total non-farm payrolls with a 17,000 additional jobs added in terms of net revisions you still got uh, 1.8 million with a big decline almost a full percentage point drop in the unemployment rate which will move to single digits uh, easily in the summer and fall leading up to this data there was a lot of reason to suggest that the pace of increase had slowed and in fact what we see in this data is of course it has slowed but the good news is that it is continuing and it is continuing despite uh, some slowdowns that we're seeing around the country as a result of an increase in cases people tend to focus on the growth rate the big the big issue is the depressed level of spending and income in the economy which is reflected in the level of the unemployment rate of around 10 percent. The Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home. While you stay inside, enjoy a curated collection of archived concerts and behind-the-scenes stories from BSO musicians. BSO Homeschool provides lessons for music lovers of all ages. New performances and messages from musicians are added regularly. Enjoy these selections and much more at bso.org slash at home. It's really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Bloomberg Surveillance, I'm Rishka Gupta. Let's get your Bloomberg Business Bash. 
Directors at General Electric have extended CEO Larry Karp's contract by two years. The coronavirus pandemic appended Karp's plan to turn around the ailing industrial giant. The GE board also revised his compensation plan. That would make it easier for Karp to take at home as much as $230 million at the end of his contract. Uber and Lyft have gotten a reprieve in California. A state appeals court ruled that the ride-hailing companies can keep operating as normal whilst they challenge a judge's order to comply with a state labor law. That law would require them to treat drivers as employees rather than as independent contractors. And Amazon is facing growing pressure to make money from its Alexa voice-activated digital assistant. Bloomberg's learned the company has paused some hiring at the Alexa division. The pullback began shortly after the pandemic gripped the U.S. in the early spring. Amazon's also considering selling ads on the Alexa service. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Thank you so much, Ritika. Now, as we continue to track the virus, Bloomberg has developed a unique partnership with the leading authority on COVID-19. Johns Hopkins has been at the forefront of the international response, and every day we bring you insight from experts in public health, infectious disease, and emergency preparedness. Well, joining us today is Andrew Pekosh. He's Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health professor and virologist. Professor Pekosh, thank you for, for joining us. What do we know about immunity? If there's a virus or if there's a vaccine, Will it work? Yeah, uh, it's important to know that and, and set realistic expectations for a vaccine. Um, we know that uh, oftentimes the vaccines that work in children are different from the ones that work well in adults, and they're both different from the ones that work in the elderly, for instance. And we know that the, the, the COVID-19 disease is very different in these three populations, and vaccines that are going to be rolled out may not be tested for all of those populations. And so when we get vaccines, there will be safety data, there will be efficacy data, but it may not be across all those populations. So the vaccines that are rolled out um, may only work for certain groups, and we may have to wait longer for vaccines that work in other groups. But Dr. Prakash, what do you want to know about the virus? So, you know, we still don't know what role T cells play in protecting you against the virus. We don't know why people end up in hospital on ventilators that are seemingly healthy and others don't even have a cold and, and have an immune response. Uh, we don't know why people, you know, take six months to maybe get rid of it, even if they're not infectious. What are the three things that we need to understand before we can say we have a handle on this, on this pandemic? Yeah, uh, so number one, uh, protective immunity. We know that if you get infected, you'll generate lots of different types of immune responses. And there are even several studies that show that um, some of your responses to common cold coronaviruses actually cross-react to COVID-19. So we know that there's a lot of good immune responses to, the vir to virus infection. We also know that your immune system remembers an infection. So a second exposure to the same virus will start a faster immune response. But what we don't know there is which of those immune responses are gonna protect you from reinfection. Because what we don't want is a situation where your immune response is maybe lessen disease but maintain transmission. Because in that scenario, we could still have the virus circulating in the population um, and not really protect people completely from, it, from infection. I think the second thing is um, understanding these mild cases and understanding what it is about your response to infection that can cause you to oftentimes have a mild disease, but sometimes have it progress to a very severe disease. Andrew, it's very difficult as a parent to decide whether you want to send your, your child back to school. And we're getting a lot of people writing in, you know, asking what they should do. What are the questions that you would ask the school? I, you know, again, it depends on the district. It, it, it depends on, on the safety measures. But what are the, th you know, three or four questions that you have to call your principal and say, look, are, are you putting this in place? Now, uh, it's such an important question. I'm actually dealing with that from both ends. As an as a instructor, we're trying to set up learning for our students that are coming in here. But I'm also the father of two children that have gone to both graduate school as well as undergraduate in the past couple of weeks um, in places where they're going to have some attempt at having in-person classes. Um, it starts with community, making sure that the virus is controlled in the community. Um, and that you're not seeing very large amounts of spread because if you're seeing large amounts of spread in the community, that's gonna spill over into the, into the school that you're attending. 
Second, you need to have good measures in place to minimize the risk of transmission. Low density in classrooms, if you're going to have in-person classrooms. Um, masks, um, you know, good, good general hygiene. Um, understanding things like the places where people get together most frequently. Um, cafeterias, lunches, breaks, those kind of things. Um, all those things need to be put into place to make sure that um, you don't have large-scale transmission in these settings. And then you need testing because you need to be able to monitor these situations because they are going to be a little bit higher risk than, than, than you would like. So lots of things need to be put in place for these to be rolled out efficiently. And we see here in the U.S. a couple of examples of schools where things just haven't rolled out well and we've immediately had to back, back up and uh, get away from in-person learning. Andrew Pekos, as always, thank you so much for all of your uh, really valuable insight. To Johns Hopkins there, uh, be sure to check out VRUS Go on the Bloomberg for the latest information and tune in every day for our exclusive conversation with Johns Hopkins experts for an inside look at battling COVID-19. Now, European stocks are actually now rising. They've been fluctuating all morning, but now focusing on a possible breakthrough in this virus vaccine. Coming up, more Bloomberg surveillance, but this time simulcast on radio and TV. This is Bloomberg. essential market data flowing seamlessly. We keep on so you can keep on. We've put ourselves on the front foot again by adapting all the company, by resizing, by adjusting production rates, by adapting the supply chain as well to this new difficult environment. with which we are moving relates more to technological advances in how you can make a vaccine even before you start testing it that makes me confident that we are going to do everything we can to determine safety. Our 
seen a lot of divergence within the market in terms of valuation. There is a disconnect between what's happening in public equity markets and what's happening on the ground. The worse that data looks on a week-to-week -week basis, hopefully the more impetus there is for a fiscal stimulus. The pace will probably slow down now that we've had this, this quick rebound. We've got less supply, and we've got uh, demand being stimulated, and that imbalance should lead to higher prices. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen. It is a simulcast on Bloomberg Radio, on Bloomberg Television, nationwide. Farrow off. He's in Tuscany somewhere. Abramowitz off. I think she's outside Toledo. Joining us now on the simulcast through the morning, Francine Lacroix in London. It's a surveillance thon. We decided to do this on purpose. It's an endurance test here. We're you know seeing we're going like a combined 42 hours each year, and we are thrilled that Francine could join us on the simulcast because Francine actually we get lucky with what the, what's happened with the scheduling, and that France with some shockingly weak economic data. Yeah, so this is PMI. Tom, what a delight to be spending, you know, four or five hours together. I think they're just trying to see who, who breaks first. My, my money, I don't know if it's on me or on you, actually. We'll see after the second hour of the simulcast. But France coming out with some PMIs that were pretty terrible. And that's really taken the market by surprise in Europe. But there was that and also Germany. Interesting response from both leaders saying that they're hoping uh, not to go into full lockdown again, or at least not close the borders. But I know you're also watching uh, the U.S. Postmaster Jennifer, you know, General testifying to the Senate, and it's really captured also the imagination of Europeans here. Well, absolutely. You know, we're going to get to the business brief here in a moment. Uh, well, here it is right now. We've got the Postmaster General testifying today, and of course, the huge backstory there, folks, is do they fold? the post office system challenges into further stimulus. We just heard from Jeannie Zeno who made very clear she feels it's to Mr. Trump's benefit to have that bill. We will see. Also as well, we've got some market data coming out on PMI in the United States. Can't believe it'll make the same splash as what we saw in Europe, but there it is. And exist, existing home sales data out as well. Let me do a data check right now. Futures at negative six, down futures negative 45. The VIX, and this is through the week, the VIX backing up from 21 uh, to 23 and the yield 0.63%. Uh, Most importantly, the real yield is a negative 0.99 percent. We've been inundated with questions about, will John Farrell be able to do the real yield this afternoon? You'll see it across Bloomberg all weekend. I'm not sure where that stands. There were many people here at Bloomberg bidding to do the real yield for uh, John uh, Farrell. I believe Taylor Riggs is uh, working out right now for that great challenge. But the real yield has become very serious and that's a good way to bring in our first guest. This is perfect uh, for the morning on equities. John Golub joins from Credit Suisse. John, I want to go right over to James Sweeney and the rest of your fixed income team and economics team. What is the real yield? <coughs> excuse me. What does the, the large negative real yield mean for equity investors? Um, you know, it's it's interesting, Tom. We've we've done a whole bunch of work on what it means for stock prices because I know that people who are looking at gold and other assets are yeah. really obsessed with this. It, it the the market cares more about nominal interest rates than real yield. They do care about this this issue of inflation. And we are when we're talking to clients, whether we have inflation or deflation on the back of this crisis, is a really big discussion point because it sets the tone for what type. of of stocks are going to win but the but in terms of the direction of the market it's the general level it's the 63 basis point on the 10 year that matters more to stocks than this negative one percent hey, you're talking about well, on the real yield right there is worth the watching of bloomberg surveillance through all of this surveillance thon right there it's the nominal yield minus inflation expectations and the residual of that is the real yield and what you're hearing from Golub is look at the nominal yield uh is is the most important determinant what does it mean, John Golub, for the big banks and for banking in general? Well, you know, and banks don't do well when there's no 
interest rates, and at 63 basis points on the 10-year, and you can pull up on your Bloomberg on what a two-year um, bond yield is is doing, which is is a lot lower than that, and banks can't be that profitable in that. Um, one of the reasons why the U.S. banks have done so poor and actually worse than European banks is because the yields in the United States have fallen meaningfully, but European <coughs> yields were so low going into this crisis, they couldn't go any lower. Um, so the the damage to U.S. banks has been much greater on a relative basis than the bank than the damage to European banks. Um, you know, as a result of this crisis, which is really, I think, a surprise to many. Uh, John Gallup, something current this morning. An hour ago, we saw John Deere come out with a better uh, view for their Q3. Certainly a surprise uh, to the market. Is that a trend that we're going to see coming here and that within the grimness and the gloom of a pandemic markdown, actually companies could do better? You know, we, we saw in the second quarter that it was the best quarter in history in terms of, of beats, how results were coming in relative to expectations. And it was also the, the single quarter where the market cared less than any other. Um, the, what people are trying to figure out is where is this thing going and what happens to Q3 earnings in the middle of this is probably more noise. People are really trying to figure out the, the kind of the trend direction. Do we have a cure? What does it do for rates? What does it do for inflation? As you were talking about, which is really the key issue. Um, but, as, but the next quarter in terms of earnings, the market really is actually shrugging its shoulders much more than you would think. Okay, so Jonathan, let's go back to, and good morning from London, it's Francine, but let's go back to this inflation versus deflation. If we were yep. to see inflation, let's say rampant inflation, where does it come from? Is it central bank action? Is it stimulus or actually is it simply supply chains? If you move supply chains and you move them back home, you know, partly because of trade wars but also because of COVID, does it just mean that prices go automatically up? Well, it, it's a really great question because recently we've had a pickup in actual inflation. And you're starting to see if you wanted to go buy a bicycle or a tennis racket or, or certain things like that, that there may be shortages because everything has been shut down and then reopened and you're seeing inflation. Right now for people who want to leave New York City and buy an apartment, an apartment but uh, uh, rent a home in the suburbs, that the prices are up because there's no additional stock of, of of homes to buy or rent and so you are seeing inflation now but it is not the kind that's going to freak the market out because this is really transitory it's because of um, kind of the result of the uh, the crisis itself the real the real question i think in terms of longer term inflation and that's really what what matters here is um, are you going to see this as a systemic issue because the fed is printing money and that it's ultimately going to be a monetary phenomenon that prices go up broadly on a sustained <clears throat> basis. If that happens, then it's going to affect asset prices. If it's something that's a near-term shortage, for example, the price of, of, of lumber is, is up, but that's not something that's a long-term trend that's, a, that's really resulting from the current crisis. That's not the thing that's, that's going to make the market uncomfortable. Um, but the real question, if you have central banks everywhere yeah. in the world printing money like crazy, then prices naturally go up, and that's the thing that people are focused on. But with a labor market that is, um, you know, with 15 million unemployed Americans, it's very hard to see right now anything that looks like underlying inflation. Jonathan, you know, there are two things that I learned in lockdown, and that was actually, yes, bicycles saw a sharp rise in inflation, and there was also a puppy shortage. I don't know whether you can model that. I mean, Tom can actually, see, you know, see a three standard deviation in prices of puppies. How do you protect yourself? Do you buy inflation protection at this moment in time? It I, I don't. I don't think so. And we, you, know, you, were, you were talking about what matters. If you in the inflation deflation argument, and I talked to Andrew Garthwaite, who's our global strategist, about this all the time. If you are, if you think that you're going to have a long-term inflation problem because of all this money printing, then value beats growth, and non-U.S. assets actually beat U.S. assets. If you think that we're going to have disinflation, and that's my view, that ultimately all of the damage that's being done here actually pushes inflation down. Um, but if that's the case, then growth wins and right. tech 
wins and large caps. So this, this discussion is not just an academic um, issue. It is the single most important issue for pension plans and hedge funds and mutual right. fund managers who want to figure out how do you play this thing, not over the next three weeks, but over the next, you know, one, two, three years. John Golub, one final question. I was thunderstruck at a cautious James Sweeney the last time your wonderful chief economist was on with us. I'd never heard Sweeney so cautious, and that's confirmed today by the statistics out of France as well. Are you investing based on Sweeney's caution? First of all, we talk all the, you know we, we talk all the time, and um, you know and we don't people don't always agree on everything. Right now, we're seeing the world the same way that the bounce that we've had, this V-shaped bounce off the bottom, is going to start flattening out as we go into <clears throat> the September October time frame, and so we believe you're going to see more data start to roll over. And we saw that, for example, with the jobs data um, yesterday on the unemployment claims, it, it has really stopped going down. And it, it's the, the improvement in the job situation has kind of flattened out. And we think we're going to see that. And James is a big proponent of the idea of industrial production, that the industrial data, which bounced really hard, big V off the bottom, that it's going to stop improving um, on a relative change basis. Mm -hmm. And so he would he would agree. He would actually, uh, I haven't spoken to him, he'd probably look at the mm -hmm. state out of France and say directionally that's not a big surprise. John Golub, thank you for the briefing with Credit Suisse. Just wonderful to see that combined research of Mr. Graithright, Mr. Sweeney, and Mr. Golub. Here's what we're going to do on a surveillance on today. Francine Lacroix rumored to stay with us through all of surveillance uh, today. That is a good and beautiful thing. We're going to talk to Kevin Searley and drive forward to the Republican convention, as it's called. I see Vice President Pence right now speaking speaking on Fox and Friends. And then Liz Ann Saunders will join us with Charles Schwab, really to talk about how you're going to think about your investment in finance world uh, through the weekend. So we've got lots going on this morning, not a normal Friday. Futures in negative six, down futures in negative 39. Yields are in, that's important. Ten-year yield to four digits, 0.6347. Francine shocked. We quote to four decimal points on surveillance. Good morning. This is Bloomberg on radio, on television. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Joe Biden slammed President Trump as a national embarrassment and vowed to end what he called the darkness. Biden accepted the Democratic nomination for president last night, and he said in his, admi his administration there would be immediate change. The days of cozying up to dictators is over. Under President Biden, America will not turn a blind eye to Russian bounties on the heads of American soldiers. Nor will I put up with foreign interference in our most sacred democratic exercise, voting. Biden also cited the coronavirus pandemic and said President Trump has failed in his most basic duty to protect Americans. And President Trump warns that he'll impose tariffs on U.S. companies that refuse to move jobs back from overseas. At a campaign event in Pennsylvania, the president said that companies that do move jobs back would get tax credits. It's not clear if the White House is actually developing such a policy, though. Pressure is growing on Hong Kong to reopen its economy. There's been a sustained decline in the number of coronavirus cases in the city, and business are pressing for restrictions on restaurants to be lifted quickly. Reports suggest that Hong Kong may not ease any restrictions until after a mass testing blitz next month. And remember billionaire Robert Smith? He's the one who ended his commencement speech at Morehouse College last year by promising to pay off student debt for the entire graduating class. Now, Bloomberg's learned Smith was being pursued by the federal government for potential tax crimes. It involves millions that moved through offshore structures. Smith's trying to resolve his case with a civil settlement rather than face criminal charges. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Best, your weekly review of the most important business news analysis and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Ken Burns, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. We have always been a mixture of things. We are always stronger for that mixture. Growth is a way to stay competitive, delight more and more consumers. Welcome to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. They've moved the needle by acknowledging that they have to monitor the content. What is one word of advice you'll take with you? learn how to listen and that is certainly something that has served me well i'm kidding where do you go from here it's a huge market it's a huge opportunity i want to go 100x from here our philosophy is to partner where we can and stand apart when we should some things you see coming some things you don't the trick is to be ready for anything John from Infrastructure Support is working every day to keep essential market data flowing seamlessly. We keep on so you can keep on. I am David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is a life-changing election. This will determine what America is going to look like for a long, long time. Character is on the ballot. Compassion is on the ballot. Decency, science, democracy. Vice President Biden and last and I were trying to drive forward the political conversation today to do this futures at negative six and simulcast Francine LaCroix in for both Lisa Bramowitz and John Farrell. That is a miracle of technology that we're doing that. In for Kevin Cirilli is Kevin Cirilli, our chief Washington <laughs> uh, correspondent, and joins us right now. Kevin, you nailed this in the last hour. Vice President Pence right now over at Fox and Friends, and they're clearly selling the message, maybe both Fox and the vice president, on law in order. Is that the platform of President Trump forward? Yep, absolutely. And in fact, it, it plays on, on two fronts. First and foremost, remember the issue back in the 2004 election when Bush was up for re-election against John Kerry and security moms were something that we heard about, those suburban uh, or the suburban women vote uh, and, and, and after 9-11. That is a, also something that played out in both 2008 uh, as well as 2012 and, and 2016. To take a modern twist on that, you look at the racial unrest and protests that it, uh, the country has experienced over the past couple of months, Tom, and the Republicans feel that the issue of security right. and law and order will help them make inroads in the suburbs. Okay, the practicing candidate here would be Ms. Harris of California, who I believe has a little bit of legal experience. How does she help Mr. Biden uh, defend against the law and order thrust of the Republicans. When I talk to Democrats, they tell me two things. First and foremost, her record in terms of being a prosecutor, she'll be able to draw a, a prosecutorial case, make a prosecutorial case against Vice President Mike Pence on a debate stage as well as on a virtual or even actual campaign trail. But secondly, her ability to, uh, to mobilize the base. And you saw this in her remarks during the convention. Uh, they feel that she'll be able to bring in some new voters to the party or to, to really motivate some new voters in the party because of her uh, a notion as, as, a, as a glass ceiling shattering vice president. Kevin, are they trying to get voters that voted Republican last time, or are they just trying to get voters that have never voted? So, voted. So, if you see, you know, the Joe Biden peach yesterday on character and decency, does it spur people that wouldn't have gone to vote to vote this time? You know, last night, uh, the nominee, Joe Biden, really made a pitch to those voters uh, that we've been talking about all week in terms of those voters who are swing voters, the, 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 it, the folks who, who vote for Democrats sometimes, Republicans another, voted for Obama, voted for Trump. That's who he was talking to last night. You saw that in terms of every, uh, in terms of all of the images, in terms of John Meacham speaking, uh, his, his tone and the, the nominee's address, all of that, from the cars that were parked outside of, uh, of Delaware to watch the fireworks, all of that was very much a suburban pitch for Joe Biden uh, to make. 
whether or not the rest of the virtual convention was that same pitch, I don't think it was. And based upon the conversations that I'm having uh, with Republicans, they would argue that it was it would lacked policy specifics as it relates to energy policy. It lacked policy specifics in terms of what the first 100 days would look like. And it left a lot of question marks. And those are the questions that Republicans are going to be asking in their speeches uh, next week at the Republicans' turn for the virtual convention. Uh, Kevin, like him or hate him, President Trump is very good at social media. It, how much social media will he do during the Republican convention, and will, could that be a game changer for them? You know, Francine, this is something that, that has been a theme throughout the past couple of weeks. If 2016 was really the start of the social media viral campaign, this is without question the extension of it. What used to be at one point when candidates and their top staffers and campaign managers and advisors would be playing to the front page and the photographers for the front pages of the, of the nation's newspapers, now they're playing for people's social media feeds. Now they're playing to have those viral moments to get inroads uh, on people's different social media platforms and to outlast uh, the news cycle and, and the news day uh, to drive the conversation forward. So absolutely, social media is going to play. Just look at the ratings, right? I mean, ratings are down 20% on average per night, uh, according to the most recent data that we have available for us for the DNC, the virtual DNC. So yeah, uh, I think, yes, absolutely. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see how the right. digital and the actual ratings and this change of medium that has been occurring not just in politics, but across cross industries. Uh, Kevin, as we go into this weekend, and I understand there's a presidential focus, brief us on the one Senate race that you're watching. There's, X, there's always X number of Senate races that are interesting, but what's the one that you're studying this weekend? Iowa. I think Iowa is fascinating. I think uh, Senator Joni Ernst, a Republican from Iowa, uh, up for a tough re-election re fight against a Democratic progressive, Teresa Greenfield. Uh, and, you know, it has everything. It has uh, the culture wars clash. It also has policy, energy policy, and then also crucial to a yeah, state like the yeah, Hawkeye State. Interesting. And, and how's that going to play? Uh, especially when progressives and the Green New Deal, they've left a lot of questions about right. specifics of that. How's that going to play? Does the welder from Iowa, Mr. Grassley, does he help Senator Ernst? Chuck Grassley is the, I would argue, based upon the conversations I have, the quintessential Republican in the Trump era. He goes against the president with a tone that is very akin to the president in terms of how he utilizes both social media and public remarks. And absolutely, they are two peas in a political pod, Grassley and Ernst. And uh, they, uh, they are all for representing the ethanol industry every which way. Uh, and, they, mm -hmm. and they don't hide it. They embrace it. And they are talking about it. And they're not afraid to take it to the president uh, when they disagree with them on ethanol. Uh, great. Kevin uh, Cerulli, thank you so much. Really, really informative. Just terrific un encyclopedic knowledge there uh, by Cerulli. There's a convention. No, it's not tonight. The Democrats. That's so this week. David Weston leading our coverage next week again on the Republican convention. We'll do it like we did before 10 p.m. on Monday. Uh, you'll begin to see the ramp up there. And of course, <clears throat> one of the great distinctions here is I believe the president will be much more evident through each night of the uh, convention. I mean, Francine, this is so different than over in England, isn't it? It certainly is, because first of all, if you look at our election campaigns, they're much, much shorter. The money, I think, is also really a fraction of the price. And so in terms of you know the show and tell, um, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's a different kind of dynamic. In the U.S., it's much more about personality, but it, it's uh, you know interesting to, to have parallels between the two. Well, I, I yearn for the quaintness of it. Frankly, folks, I wish we had some of the British attributes here, but you're not going to get that with a parliamentary um, system. What you are going to get on our surveillance sign today with Francine Lacroix, in for John Farrow and Lisa Bram. What's a negative seven on the futures? Dow futures, negative 45. The VIX, 23.16. That's up two big figures uh, pretty much from the beginning of the week. I do have to mention gold down $10, 1936 an ounce. Painful for people like me that bought it in 2040 or maybe it was 2038. Coming up, Lizanne Saunders of Charles Schwab on the enduring values of equity. Thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. We continue. Good morning.
true diversification. That's what adding commodities exposure to your stock and bond portfolio can help provide. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the standard for commodity market exposure. 23 traded commodities are represented. Agriculture, livestock, metals, and energy. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the benchmark most widely used by investment professionals globally. Track your commodity investments with a proven financial information partner. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. True diversification. The Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home, a collection of concerts, at-home lessons, and behind-the-scenes stories to enjoy while you stay at home. Learn more at bso.org slash at home. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, our simulcast, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, a surveillance thon today. Francine Lacroix and for Lisa Bramowitz and John Farrow, and that is a good and wonderful uh, thing because news out of Europe, we've been talking about the slowdown in France. I want to really digress here, Francine. This isn't something you normally do, but like Brexit is a new Brexit because of the pandemic. How has Brexit yeah. changed because of this huge, huge viral catastrophe? First of all, Tom, I need to qualify it. It's a well-caffeinated Francine that joins you for four hours we on liked it. TV. Very good. Um, Brexit once again actually took the headlines today. <laughs> we were looking at Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator on the European Commission side, uh, briefing reporters in Brussels about the fact that there just wasn't enough progress. <clears throat> That's having an impact on uh, Sterling, actually. And it does seem that both the EU and the UK are warning that there's just not enough progress for the moment to find a deal before the end of December. But remember, Tom, they still have two months to negotiate. I don't know whether, you know, right. the UK has once again said that they won't ask for an extension. It could be like the EU where at the 11th hour they find an agreement, where actually the, the UK government would rather not find any agreement and go to WTO rules. Francine, you're so wired into the zeitgeist over there. Is Europe heading back to recession? Is that the right phrase? So this time you're talking about, um, you know, the, the uh, for example, the, the uh, German numbers and the French numbers, which were really quite shocking. What was interesting, if you look at the pattern since the lockdown started in March, is that initially we had better than expected figures in terms of GDP growth. And then today the PMI numbers were pretty bad. Some of it may be seasonal because even though there was, a, you know, COVID-19, um, a lot of France and many parts in Europe stop and, and go on holiday in July and August. But it, it's going to be an interesting trajectory. You know, it's not as smooth um, sailing as maybe we thought about six, seven weeks ago. So different right now. I wanted to bring this up because of the slowdown, the shock of the French PMI numbers. And now to America, we welcome all of you on our simulcast on Bloomberg Radio, on Bloomberg Television. And we go to Lizanne Saunders of Charles Schwab. Uh, her, her experience at Schwab is extraordinary. And Lizanne, I want to go back to the moments like with Lou Rukeyser a few years sure. ago, where there were big events. We're now into not a big event, but almost a weekly and indeed monthly numbness of struggling news. How do you invest given a numbness? Yeah, I, it is an extraordinary period of time. And I, I really think, and I would say this, I suppose, in a normal market environment, but investors have to remember that some of the basics around uh, rebalancing, broad diversification, I think really come into play in this environment. I, I continually get questions about whether to be in this market, be it given high valuations or election uncertainty, should I get out now and either get in or get out? Uh, and I think that's sort of the moxie of, of some of the newly minted day traders uh, is a long-term investing strategy. And I think in this environment, more frequent rebalancing driven by volatility and what asset classes are doing, letting your portfolio tell you when it's time to do something keeps us in gear by sort of forcing mm -hmm. us to trim into strength and add into weakness, which is ultimately the, the, the best path to long-term success. Some of your research, Lizanne, is about volume, about retail trades, about the confidences that are out there. Measure for us a pile of money on the sidelines. How big is the mountain of cash? Well, it really depends on what type of investor you're looking at, and that's really extraordinary. If you look at the most active investors, their equity exposure has gone well up, so there's not a lot of cash there. If you look at 
uh, more traditional investors. And you, there was a recent Gallup poll. You can look at overall household exposure to equities. That's been coming down. So that's another unique part of this market environment is you really have significant divergence in terms of both behavioral and attitudinal measures of investor sentiment and what their positioning is. So if you look at the cohort of newer, younger, more active day traders, uh, their exposure is extraordinarily high. But if you look at more seasoned investors, both on the retail side and the institutional side, they've had a bit more skepticism about this and are holding uh, larger amounts of, of cash. So it really is a unique environment where you have to break investors into various cohorts, in some cases, as a function of age, um, to get a sense of where there's excess and where there's still opportunity. But, uh, Lizanne, where do, you know, is volatility more volatility a given? Because just simply the number of infections are rising because of COVID-19, and it will be much more difficult to read the economy. I, I think economic volatility is absolutely a given. We've seen diminishing equity volatility as measured by things like the VIX, but I think as we move into the fall, that's likely to pick up. Even absent any news on the virus front, I think election-related volatility tends to pick up in the post-Labor Day environment. So I would certainly expect that to be the case this time. But I think economic volatility, absolutely, not just driven by number of cases. And there's been a big focus on, on vaccines, and I think the market would obviously be pleasantly surprised if we do get near-term news on a vaccine, but I think just as important would be news on therapeutics, because we have to remember that upon an announcement of a vaccine that's ready for humans, there'll be all the follow-on questions on efficacy, availability, the percentage of people willing to take it. So I, I don't think uh, the headline we're looking for on a vaccine answers all the questions that we uh, have now or will then. Lizanne, should we spend a lot more time trying to figure out, you know, what companies will go into liquidation, will go bankrupt? And, and well, is this because of COVID-19 or is it just an acceleration of trend? Well, we're seeing a heightened uh, level of bankruptcies akin to what we saw back in 2009, but we also have Fed facilities that have been able to sort of stem that tide a little bit. I still think it's a factor, particularly when we look at the relationship between temporary un unemployed and permanent job losses. And those have been going effectively in the wrong direction. We've seen a decline in temporary layoffs and a rise in, in permanent job losses. And I think that will continue to be tied to bankruptcies filings. Now, for <clears throat> now, defaults have been held at bay in large part due to what the Fed has done. But I also yeah. think that there might be less willingness on the part of some small companies that are facing an existential threat to their business to try to stay afloat via what the Fed has done or other mm. means. So that may be what's different in this environment versus last time. If you really question your long-term survivability, uh, I think so there are some companies that are just throwing in the towel right now. On Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, a simulcast. Francine LaCroix and for Lisa Bramowitz and John Farrow, we welcome all of you on this Friday. Lizanne, I didn't know this was going to be a theme of the week on a Monday, but here it is, and that is diversification or Peter Lynch's diversification, whatever it may be. Are we over-diversified in our retirement plans? Uh, actually, we, we think not. Uh, in fact, if we look at the lack of rebalancing that's done, particularly U.S. versus uh, rest of world, there is a significant bias within portfolios toward U.S. equity exposure, largely because the lack of rebalancing and the outperformance. And I think, you know, what tends to happen as you move from one cycle into another cycle, you do see tend to see a reversal in leadership. And we do think there is an opportunity for non-U.S. to provide some <clears throat> diversification, which hasn't been the case in the last few well, years. But, but I don't I'm mean to interrupt, sure, Liz, 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 Liz but way. this is really important. Are you talking about European multinationals, Swiss, Nestle's, et cetera, Siemens? Oh, well, I'm are not you... talking about individual names or individual companies. No, I understand, but are you not... talking big cap or are you talking EM? Uh, talking just developed international markets, emerging markets within portfolios at the broad asset class level, uh, not specific to any country. I, I do still think large caps, uh, both <clears throat> in the United States and globally, um, will be mm -hmm. in the leadership uh, position. I think the, the fundamental differential from a percentage of zombie companies, debt to equity ratios, all the quality factors that have been dominant in performance across 
NASA classes, you mentioned globally across uh, sectors. I think that quality uh, bias in factors will define leadership more than things right. like sectors or even countries. Lizanne, in the time that we got left to you with your public service in the Bush administration on fiscal policy as well, how troubled should our listeners and viewers be over the size of these deficits, the rapidity of which we've seen these trillion dollar deficits? I think we should be troubled long term. We're all MMTers now. I think if there's one area for bi uh, bipartisan support, it's for kicking the uh, the deficit and debt can down uh, the road, and there doesn't seem to be much concern about this. Now, I don't view this as an as a debt bubble bursting accident uh, at a moment in time. I view this as a simmering <clears throat> crisis over time because what's been shown not just here in the United States, but anywhere around the globe, a high and rising burden of debt, even if it doesn't cause an, a, a moment in time crisis, it's an impediment to an economy being able to grow at a robust pace. You know, we all celebrated the longest economic expansion in mm -hmm. history, the most recent one, but it was also by far the weakest. And I think one of the reasons for that is the high debt burden. And interest costs are swamping everything else the government spends money on. And even in a no-rise interest rate environment, just increasing the debt at the pace we are means that interest payments, even in a flat yield environment, start to really swamp spending on anything else. So uh, I think it is absolutely a long-term problem, and I think the effect of it is a slower pace of growth than would otherwise be possible. Liz Ann Saunders, thank you so much. Very valuable conversation this morning with Charles Schwab, of course. But this is really what we've tried to do uh, all, all this week, is give you conversations, differing opinions on fixed income and equity uh, as well. Uh, Francine, I thought uh, James Athey, uh, 17 hours ago, I believe, is when we speak, picked up the surveillance thon. And I thought that James <laughs> Athey was really, really interesting about he doesn't want to be in Europe. Yeah, he, he was actually quite scathing, which was interesting, Tom, because uh, many analysts and, you know, fixed income specialists that we've been speaking to thought that the EU recovery plan was a real game changer. But he was saying, look, if you look at the economic pattern, and I guess it's really been validated by this much worse than expected PMI figure out of France this morning, you know, it, it could be more difficult ahead. Again, you have different economies, especially, Tom, mm -hmm. if, if we have the so-called hard Brexit. So the UK at the end of the year leaving on WTO terms. Uh, we will continue. Francine LaCroix and for Lisa Bramowitz and John Farrell, it is a simulcast on Bloomberg Television, on Bloomberg Radio. Later on radio, Gene Munster of Loop Ventures. It could be on any number of techie topics. Maybe we'll talk about Cupertino. Futures deteriorate, negative 11. Gold deteriorates, $21, $19.26 an ounce. I'm getting crushed. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. A simulcast. duty to protect Americans. Last night, Biden accepted the Democratic nomination for president, and he made it clear what a Biden administration would tackle first. As president, the first step I will take will be to get control of the virus that has ruined so many lives. Because I understand something this president hasn't from the beginning. We will never get our economy back on track. We will never get our kids safely back in schools. We'll never have our lives back until we deal with this virus. Biden also said the U.S. doesn't need a tax code that rewards wealth more than it rewards work. He says it's time for the biggest corporations to pay their fair share. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has formally demanded that the United Nations reinstate global sanctions against Iran. Pompeo also slammed European allies who oppose the move. He accused them of a failure to lead and of accusing the Iranian regime. President Trump says that this will be the most fraudulent election in history. The president told Fox News, quote, they're trying to steal the election. He said that mail-in voting will lead to a widespread cheating, even though there's been no evidence of that in previous elections. 
An actress, Laurie Loughlin, and her designer husband appear to be headed for prison. They'll be sentenced today for paying a half million dollars in bribes to get their daughters into the University of Southern California. They pleaded guilty to taking part in a college admission scandal that showed just how far some wealthy parents would go to get their kids admitted. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. forecast 1 million 800,000 jobs is the total non-farm payrolls with a 17,000 additional jobs added in terms of net revisions you still got uh, 1.8 million with a big decline almost a full percentage point drop in the unemployment rate which will move to single digits uh, easily in the summer and fall leading up to this data there was a lot of reason to suggest that the pace of increase had slowed and in fact what we see in this data is of course it has slowed but the good news is that it is continuing and it is continuing despite uh, some slowdowns that we're seeing around the country as a result of an increase in cases people tend to focus on the growth rate the big the big issue is the depressed level of spending and income in the economy, which is reflected in the level of the unemployment rate of around 10%. such an interesting new world. The world is changing. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. Well, everyone is zigging, we're zagging. We feel like we can maybe help people out more. We have an enormous number of big ideas. I do double down on helping other black founders, whether it's fundraising, hiring, growth, product, whatever it is that they need. up to do on that front so we are expecting to see a little bit of strength coming through at the start of trade how long will it last though uh, the perennial question this is a step in the right direction perhaps it's a hard begin uh, for, for more uh, changes in the future like uh, the completion of the banking union tells you nothing about what the market's going to do in the next six months or the next 12 months. It's really an indication of long-term returns. Dan Suzuki there, very good at the mathematics. Thrilled to see him out uh, making comments as well. What we're going to do is have some fun here on a Friday. We can do that in, uh, in August. And to set this up, Sarah Halsek with us with Bloomberg Opinion, covering all of retail. And we're going to go luxury retail here right now. And we can do that. Because what you don't know, folks, is sitting four seats of wind tower at the Burberry February show before this pandemic was Francine Lacroix, very active on the London fashion scene. Francine, what was it like just before the pandemic to see the last gasps of luxury fashion? 
Yeah, Tom, when you say very active on the fashion scene, it's basically very actively trying to get an interview with the Burberry chief executive that has not quite come through yet, <laughs> but we persist, and so we go to the catwalks and, uh, of course, try and get a bit of time with him to try and understand mm -hmm. uh, some of the nuances behind these luxury numbers. So it, it was in February. It was interesting because it, it was in the West End, um, you know, a place that was disused, and actually it was, at the time, one of the first really big shows because Burberry, <coughs> because it's a listed company, uh, puts on, you know, puts on a, a pretty big show, but it's also a money spinner. It was one of the first ones where the Chinese buyers weren't there because yeah. COVID-19 yeah. was really rampant in Wuhan. And I remember at the time there was, a, you know, the, the big question amongst the, the kind of the financial analysts at the catwalk or at the fashion show was, what are we going to do without the Chinese buyers? And then, you know, you forward, you know, fast forward six months, and actually, there were no buyers at all. The last catwalks were empty. And if you don't feel the product, you know, you, you wonder how right. much of a hit a lot of these big luxury companies have had unless they have an online presence. Extremely well said. And that brings in our expert on this, Sarah Halsek. And we're thrilled that she could join us today. Sarah, just as Francine says, it's a tactile business. What is the crisis in luxury retail right now? Well, it's definitely that, but it's also that luxury is an industry that really depends on tourism, and clearly uh, that has just been decimated by the pandemic.